the morning star drive on 17.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. How's it going? It is Wednesday, September 9th, and this is the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. We're on YouTube, so make sure to subscribe, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. Today we'll get some coronavirus updates. Also, the largest recorded wildfire in California history is getting bigger and bigger and realizing from the Tuesday pre-dawn message. So... How are you guys doing today? It is already Wednesday. It's the middle of the week, and I hope you guys are uh, have a lot of anticipation, not only because it's the middle of the week. We're already halfway through, but tonight is the Wednesday service. We get some awesome message tonight. So just thank you for all of you joining us here on the Morning Star Drive. I want, want to remind everyone to keep liking and commenting, and I want to hear you guys and see how you're doing, get your requests, your stories, any of those things. I would love to hear them and even uh, share them here on the Morning Star Drive. So remember, this week's Sunday edition, you guys remember who it was? From Japan, it's Moe Hayashibara. And make sure to catch up on that interview and know that there is another exciting uh, Sunday edition that's going to come up this week. Where is this person from? You're going to find out tomorrow. So look forward to another inspiring interview. So let's get into the featured artist of the day. Today's featured artist is from Canada, and it is Sung Beats. Now, this is an album that I haven't actually spent a lot of time on, but now I'm listening to it. It's pretty good, right? And I really I really enjoyed it. This one song uh, is from the Education album. And if you look at it, it's like a cartoon when you just look at the, the album cover. So it almost... It, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, okay, cool. It's like, it's for Milky Ways or for SS. We got a list of the songs. The songs are really, really good. Uh, the song we're going to play today from this education album from Sung Beats in Canada is Daily Life of Prayer. Cool. Second song from Japan is Rising Japan Radio with the song Hope of Flower. And the Sumni Boys takes the last song, Tales of a Longing Heart album. And the song is called The Sound of My Heart. So everyone keep supporting these artists from around the world. Help, help them. Uh, through prayer and listen to their music so that they can spread this message across the world. So we 
to the end. Make up your mind. Stop spiritual poverty. Only with the Trinity we will rapture and love for eternity. This time is for you. This time is for me. With the Trinity. Oh, this time is for you. This time is for me. With the Trinity. Through our daily life of
And that is the So Many Boys from the Tales of a Longing Heart album. That song is Sound of My Heart. And the two songs before that was Rise in Japan Radio with Hope of Flower. And the feature artist of the day was Sung Beats in Canada with the song from the education album Daily Life of Prayer. Yeah, so uh, go ahead. Keep listening to those tracks. Yeah, that's Sung Beats. Uh, I didn't... I'm not sure how I missed those songs, but there's an entire album that I haven't seen, which means we have more music we can listen to here on the Morning Star Drive. And that brings us over to our coronavirus updates of the day. So what is happening in the world in this midweek on a Wednesday? We have 27.4 million cases around the world with almost 900,000 deaths. And here's the thing, guys. I think it's the first time I've seen this in about maybe three, four months, uh, maybe three months. The world mortality rate just went up like by 0.01%. It went up to 3.26%. So that's quite interesting. Uh, across the board on the top six, uh, every all most of them went down. But there are a few cases uh, in the same region that we're going to take a look at that are going up. So look at if we look at the U.S. It's 6.4 million cases with 193,000 deaths, just closing in on 200,000 deaths at 2.98 percent. So it went down 0.01 percent. India up to 4.2 million cases with 72,000 deaths at 1.7 percent. Brazil 4.1 million cases, 127,000 deaths at 3.06 percent. Russia comes back into the mix because they're in the top six again, and they are at 1 million cases, 17,000 deaths at 1.73%. Now, these last two on the top six, they both went up, and they're both in South America. And they're relatively new. Uh, it's Co Colombia with 671,000 cases, with 21,000 deaths went up to 3.22%, and Argentina uh, 488,000 cases with 10,000 deaths, and they're up to 2.08%. Uh, the Philippines, 238,000 cases, 3,800 deaths at 1.63%. Sweden went down to 6.82% mortality rate. And Belgium uh, just went down, I think, like 0.2%, all the way down to 11.16%. Let's take a look at some of the daily infection uh daily infection rates uh, for the top six countries in the world. Uh, number one, uh, holding steady at number one, is India with 75,000 cases at 2% growth rate. Uh, the U.S., interestingly, has... Um it's been a while, but they're under 30,000 now. There are 25,000 cases for the day, and they're at 0%. And Brazil, too. Like, you think 25,000 was low, and you think that the U.S. might have been second, uh, third instead of second, but Brazil went down to 10,000 cases. So you know that it looks like both the U.S. and Brazil are on a steady decline, and they're kind of over the, the major part of the virus. Uh, Argentina has 9,200 cases at 2% growth. Uh, Colombia at 5,300 cases at 1%, and Russia comes back onto the top six with 5,100 uh, cases at 1% growth rate. Uh, this brings us into the, uh, the current news of the day. And this has been going on for a while. I just didn't know how serious it was until I started reading a little bit on uh, what's going on uh, with uh, the wildfires over there in, um, in California. So in America, like, it's not just America. It's the entire world. There are so many things happening at the same time. Besides the pandemic, there's there's famine, there's drought, there's plague of locusts, there's flooding. It's like everything combined at once is all happening. Now, this is this is uh, very interesting, especially what happened last weekend. So, California had one of its hottest weekends uh, ever observed. Okay, ever observed. Now. I'm going to tell you how hot it got over there. It got to 121 degrees. Now, guys, this is not Celsius because if it was 121, uh, everyone would be melting, right? It's going to be 128 degrees Fahrenheit because that's what they use like only in America pretty much. And what is that in Fahrenheit? Uh, in Celsius, guys, that is 49 degrees Celsius. It's almost 50. So this is crazy. So it's one of California's hottest weekends ever. And it's during a time of a severe fire. And uh, like California is pretty much almost, the entire state is almost encompassed by this wildfire that's going on. And large portions, uh, uh, it's kind of like, it's threatening a large portion of the Western United States. Uh, and it's crazy. Because like, it's not like in America, there's like other weather things going on. And what's even crazier is like, just right, you know, right next to California is Colorado. And Colorado is bracing for a 60 degree temperature drop in 48 hours. So you went from like 100 something degrees and you're gonna go drop down half 
in about 48 hours. Uh, and that's that's kind of what's going on over there in America. But over the weekend, California is like it's like blistering temperatures, surging to almost 50 degrees Celsius in LA County, and it intensified. Uh, basically, the fires that are already going on, man, it's intensifying and it's fueling new fires. So there are certain regions like uh, there's a Creek Fire in the Sierra National Forest, and it's about 290 miles, which would be about what 400 kilometers north of Los Angeles. And it's been growing, and from Friday night, uh, like it's been growing so much, it's like 78,000 acres now. From Friday to Monday, it went to 78,000 acres. And this fire is like, you know, because of the blaze, there's like all these, the smoke and the smoke clouds that gather. And these smoke clouds are actually triggering lightning, and uh, they're spawning, they're pro- most, they said they're most likely spawning fire tornadoes. So at least 10 people, were, 10 people were injured from the fire. More than 200 people were uh, rescued by the California Air National Guard, like taking them out, evacuating them through helicopters. And um, man, the weekend blazes basically pushed the area, like the, the area that's burned in California, it's over 2 million acres. And this is the record, the most burned on record in a single wildfire season. Okay, so since modern records have began since 1987, even before the most dangerous part part of the fire season had begun. Okay, so uh, there's a person in California, a fire California fire spokesman, confirmed that this is the most acres burned in any year in modern record keeping history. Okay, so they say the average. Remember, it's over two million so far and still going. On average, about 310,000 acres burn in an average fire season between January and August 30th, okay? So fires in California alone have burned at least 3,300 structures to date and killed eight according to uh, California fire press release. Now, the state has already seen its second, third, and fourth largest fires on record just this year, okay? So we've seen number one, and now we've only seen, now we've seen two, three, and fourth, the fourth, second largest, third largest, and fourth largest fires are all on record in 2020, and they are still burning right now. So uh, they're still growing, and smoke from these blazes uh, it basically streams from coast to coast over the entire lower 48 states. So the ingredients responsible for these volatile fire conditions in the Pacific Northwest are similar to what drives the infamous Santa Ana winds in Southern California. They're namely zones of high and low pressures, and they're very close to each other, right? So it, it's, it drives offshore winds through the mountains where they rush downhill and dry out the air. So the high pressure zone sinking out of Canada toward the Rockies is abnormally strong these days for this time of year. And while low pressure lurks along the West Coast, and this is causing more fires to happen, and as this pressure sinks south, it will increase California's fire risk uh, even more, which means yesterday and today. And this is going to set up uh, like Southern California's first Santa Ana wind event of the season. So typically, these events are more commonly seen in October, November, but it's happening right now in, in early September. Um, Man, so it, it's pretty crazy because the gust, the winds will gust like 40 to 50 miles per hour, which is roughly about 100, a little bit under, maybe around 70 to 90 kilometers an hour, right? And that's going to happen across uh, the mountains. So, yeah, it's this is what's going on, right? The fire danger in California, it wasn't as high, but now it's elevated even more because of these winds that are coming in. So there's numerous locations in the, in, uh, the west coast of America and they're experiencing they're all experiencing their hottest september day which was both saturday and sunday and in some cases it was both days it was the hottest ever for september and uh, a few a few spots saw their highest temperatures uh ever observed in any month so on just on sunday right so we're looking at three days ago 99 percent of california's population was under an excessive heat warning or heat advisory according to the weather service um office in uh, the capital city of California, which is Sacramento, and the weather service in Los Angeles called the heat epic. That's what they called it. The weather service in Los Angeles called the heat epic and unprecedented, and it wrote, it cannot be stressed enough that it is a very dangerous and life-threatening heat wave. So yeah, this is what's happening over there, way over there in California. Um, of course, there's a bunch of other news going on around, going on around the world. Uh, for those of you who remember that I talked about 
uh, the opposition party in Belarus was poisoned, like the, the main leader of the opposition party. And I believe he came out of his coma, but they're not sure how uh, safe he's going to be. But they did find out that um, that the poison in his system was uh, a Russian nerve agent. So uh, governments are getting a little bit nervous how they're why they're using this illegal uh, nerve agent again, right? So, yeah, lots of things happen in the world. Uh, it's not getting any better at the moment. It just seems like things are getting worse and worse. And we really just gotta make sure we pray that uh, these situations change a lot more. I'm just, I'm very grateful that I'm in, in Southeast Asia right now, especially Malaysia. Malaysia's pretty chill when it comes to like coronavirus and uh, the lockdown is, it's a minimal lockdown. And uh, for those of you who don't know, because our, our, our uh, movement control order was pushed till December 31st, uh, I, uh, my, my visa, autom my, my travel visa automatically tr like it goes all the way to December 31st plus two weeks. So it's pretty pretty exciting for me that I can stay a little longer. I don't have to spend so much money on flight tickets and stuff. So I'm very happy and thankful to God. And this brings us into uh, a time we got uh, praise, a time of praise and worship. The first song uh, we're going to have is going to be a Chinese praise song. It's a new song, and it just came out two days ago on Renee's, um, on Renee's SoundCloud channel called uh, Heavily Inspired Music. And this is a song that's not out in English yet. It's only in Chinese so far. So, um, wow, like kudos to her for uh, bringing out this music quick because it's not coming out in English anytime. It doesn't come out very quickly in English. This is only in uh, Chinese and Korean, I believe. And the song is called Our Fruits. And the second song and third song will be English, The Lord's Love, and it'll be I Believe.
as I am walking on this road that leads to the city of gold. The Lord said is planted in my center and on the Lord's wings I will rapture higher. I believe that the will has been fulfilled. I believe that my spirit rose with him. I believe I'm living in the city of gold. And in this life, I will always As for me, I'll walk this path unchanging. I'll do what I must, and I'll never turn back. I believe that the will has been fulfilled. I believe that my spirit rose. song is I Believe. I hope you guys just had an awesome time giving glory to the Holy Trinity. We sang three songs to them from the Lord's Love, I Believe. And of course, the first song is a new song uh, brought out by Renee Lee, Lai and uh, from Taiwan and just came out two days ago on her SoundCloud channel. And that song is Our Fruits. So that moves us into uh, a really important part of our uh, program. Of course, it is when we go into the words of God. And the words of God, of course, they're deep each and every day, each and every week. Uh, but we're going to focus here on the Tuesday message. So in the Tuesday message, uh, a lot of different Proverbs that came out, and a couple of them that uh, really made me think a little bit more deeply about uh, uh, the words that we're receiving too. And I believe one of the first Proverbs was better to have a, one large house than 10 small houses. And I think it was also better to have one good environment than 10 bad environments, right? So it's very, very interesting. Uh, the concept itself is that it takes more effort to make one big thing rather than 10 small things, and that one big thing uh, is much more beneficial than the 10 small things, right? So the, the concept actually makes, makes a lot of sense too. Uh, when I was really thinking about this because the impact of a large house is much higher than the impact of 10 small houses or environments or whichever one it is. Because a large house, what can you do with a large house? A large house can do, like you can have events, you can have parties, you can invite people over, you have more things to do inside your own house, you can personalize it better. There's just so many different things you can do with a larger house. And I'm sure the one thing, you know, 
Uh, one thing that's really kind of funny is, especially when you come to church, like money sometimes is a taboo thing. Like, oh, you can't talk about money. Oh, it's not about business kind of thing, right? But when you think about it, there's one time since I gave a message and the message was basically like, hey, how many of you kind of wish you were in a better house or a bigger house, like better appliances, more room, you know, that you had, you know, and, and the more and more you think about it, it's like, yeah, it's true. Like we would rather have a bigger place. We, we would. And uh, it's funny because I, I was watching uh, this one thing on YouTube. Uh, it, was, it was about this new mega house. It's a half a billion dollars. Okay, guys? It's a half a billion dollars in California. And it's this mega mansion that's like 100,000 square feet, which is roughly around like what? It's like over 300,000 square meters, guys. That's how huge it is. Okay? It's, it's half a billion dollars. And I was looking at like the video of it. It's like it's got a glass, like all the wall, like in this, there's a glass library. All the walls are glass and this library with the roof is like 40 feet high. There's a bowling alley. There's a 40 seat movie, movie theater. There's an indoor, outdoor, like kind of like nightclub place. There's a jellyfish aquarium. There are four outdoor infinity pools. And there's an, also an indoor swimming pool, which is the largest in uh, California and you know I'm just like what like the place is huge and it's overlooking like the city it's really beautiful I was like man what could you do there I, like even for myself because I I always was I, I, I was uh I grew up in like running full-time profits I'd be like man you could fit like a thousand people in there we could all sleep and it wouldn't be a problem but it's it's amazing like when you look at these huge houses and it's not just a mansion they're called mega mansions okay so it's, it's much bigger it's not the most expensive house in the world because the most expensive house i believe is uh it's that it's that big house in uh it's in india i believe and that one's like worth a billion dollars so that's crazy itself that's one person's house right but um i always look at this house and you see that man if you had this one huge house how much better would it be than having 10 small houses, right? And when you look at that, it's like, yeah, because 10 small houses, you can only do small things in each of the houses. And then if you wanted to go, like, imagine you made each of the houses, like one is where you sleep, one is where the kitchen, then you'd have to drive around all day just trying to do things in these 10 small houses. But this, this, I was watching this mega mansion thing, it was just ridiculous. And um, of course, it moved, it moved more into even if you build the house, you got to put effort into it because anyone can make 10 small houses, right? Because you could just take 10 small houses, put on the same property and they can all be like straw thatched roof, right? And it's just going to be pathetic. It'd be bugs. It's going to be hot. It's going, you know, it's, it's not going to have all the amenities that you wanted. And it's not going to take a lot of effort compared to one of these larger houses. And I was looking into the difference between how much a house, like how long it takes a house to build, right? They say that an average time to build a regular just a regular production home is about six months just a regular production and then if you customize your house it'll take an extra three months which is you know so it's nine months now but then i looked up how long did it take to make this mega mansion okay this mega mansion took five years and you see it takes more effort it takes more time but it's something that is so much more beneficial uh, i was looking at this other house too on um on the internet and it has a, a, like a nuclear bunker. So even if a nuclear bomb went off, uh, you go deep into the ground and you have like five apartments, you have like uh, a workout room, all these things down there with air conditioning enough. And uh, even if the air is tainted, uh, they have enough air there for you to live for an entire year, enough food for an entire year where you can wait till all the nuclear, like uh, what do you call it? The radioactive, like the radioactivity goes away. And that, that little bunker house was like $17 million. I'm like, dang. And can you imagine how, much it, how long it took to make that? Because you have to dig like how many meters in the ground that you won't be affected by a nuclear blast. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I was looking at this, I was like, wow, that is so amazing. Uh, but the, the issue then comes into like uh, that proverb is really good because is it better to have one large thing or 10 small things and the answer is better to have one large thing and that made me think a lot about it makes me think right now about what about the things right now in our lives like it's the things that we have the things that we hold uh is it better to have like multiple small things like even you know i was thinking, even thinking about like in a country is it better to have like 10 small churches or one large church 
in a country. Because the benefit will be far bigger. Actually, this was, I had a discussion with someone uh, about this the other day. Like, uh, when you look at the way that they did the Lord's churches, they had like all these amazing people coming to one church, the largest church in Korea and in the world. And in the beginning, too, it was really, really large. And it was now, if you look at the impact later, this one big church makes a huge impact, right? So it, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of people want to come visit the church. People want to learn. It's just, it's just amazing, right? But, the, but, but if you think about it, if you have 10 small churches and they're all doing well, but, but you know, it's relative because when a small church does well, um, the impact won't be as huge on, on like an entire nation. Can you imagine if the Lord's Church started in like a pioneering church with five people? The impact would not be as huge. It wouldn't be as big. But when you think about it, yeah, man, you have this huge church that everyone in Korea can go to. They'll see like what it looks like to have this grand, amazing, best praise band, best pe preacher, best like of everything was there, right? Best education, just everything was growing constantly. And even if you took a pioneering church and you had 10 small churches or whatever it is, and they're all pushing in like five to, like maybe five to 10 people passing a year, right? like that, that come to church a year, that comes to anywhere from like what, uh, 50 to 100, oh no, 100 to 200 people passing from those 10 different churches. But if you have one church that's like 2,000, 3,000, and they're doing, they're, they're gonna be doing that no problem of 200, 300, right, uh, of people uh, coming into those churches. And what's even bigger is these people in the small churches will go visit the big churches and they're gonna be they're gonna get a bigger impact, like wow, this is what the church is supposed to look like. Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. There's the atmosphere, the praise, the preaching, the tech, the sound, everything is just done in such a massive, uh, amazing way. That even having one large church would be better than ten small, small churches too, right? So even when I was thinking about this, like, oh, it's true. With like, we really need to, like, uh, like imagine we went the opposite direction. Imagine one of the small churches is doing really well, but then what happens usually is like you'll have small churches in small towns or smaller cities, but most of the people are going to eventually go to the big city. But imagine if the churches in the big city weren't doing well. Then you have these people who are really fiery, like these five to ten people that are really fiery. They go into the big city, and then the big city church is like dead. Then you go into this loop, right? The loop would basically be um, these people would be on fire in their home church, but when they go move to the city to, to get a job, to get married, everything else, then everyone dies. You know what I mean? Like everyone starts losing their fire and their faith. And it's, it's far better to have, you know, that one big place, that one, like even when it says one good environment rather than 10 bad environments, just think about churches too. Imagine you have one church that has this amazing, amazing environment everyone can learn from rather than, you know, 10 having these like qual like quantity of 10 huge, like, no, not huge, 10 different churches all over the city, but yet the atmosphere is not very good at all. It's better to put them all together and bring them into one place that has an amazing atmosphere more than anything else. So I, I and, and, and the, just the fact that, uh, that the effort makes a big difference too of not just having the 10 houses, how much effort you're gonna put in that house. Like, you know, it's easy to make a, thro a straw thatched, straw thatched house, right? And, and then uh, I, liked, I liked it, no matter what you do, no matter what all the work that you do in your life, you gotta put effort into it, no matter what. You have to put effort into it. And the great point is, uh, if you put in so much effort, then it looks good to you. And that makes sense, right? Because if you put a lot of effort in, because you invested so much, the value of that place becomes much higher because of what you know what you put into it. That's a great thing because it might not be the best thing in the world, but the thing that you made, it is valuable to you. It's good in your eyes because you, because you put in so much effort. Things without effort, uh, the message said that things without effort, what happens to it? It crumbles, right? Things without effort crumble, which means that even if it's something that might even be decent, but because you didn't put a lot of effort into it, there's not a lot of value in your eyes, right? There's not, it doesn't bring a lot of value. It's easy to get rid of. It's easy to change it. It's easy to lose the value. It's easy to, to lose it because you don't value it as much. And that effort actually gives value to something because if there's no effort, there's no work, there's no effort we put into something, then it's not as valuable to us. It's just like uh, getting a car that, 
Like you get a car from your parents and it's like a really nice car and then you work for every single penny for a, a not as nice car. But the way you treat it is going to be different because you know the value of what you put into it. Right? So you have these, these cars, you know, sometimes people don't, when you see someone who doesn't value something, it's like, oh yeah, no, you know, no one can eat, no, oh, yeah, eat my car. Oh no, I have no napkins. Oh, just wipe your greasy hands on my seat, right? But if someone values it, oh, sorry, man, I just got this car. I don't want, I, no, there's no eating in my car. Yeah, you know, I, I got, I just vacuumed it. This is, please, no eating. So let's eat it at home, right? And it, and it makes sense. When you value something, you don't want to take the risks on things that you don't need to take risks on. And then into this, which is great because that's why uh, in the message, from the very beginning of the morning message, it's like this, this, this parable of making houses is perfect. It is the perfect parable. And it is because after we learn all these things about putting effort into making a house, a bigger house, smaller house, we're learning about these things. The segue is perfect because the segue is into making yourself. And that's why I was like, whoa, this is like a great lecture in itself. It segues into now this house is you. You got to make yourself. You have to make yourself reach the best, the highest, the greatest level that you can. And then when you do this, then you can be used by God. But then why do you want to be used by God? And this point was, for me, it made me think a lot and then it was really, really inspiring. Being used by God, and from that point out, you were living the life of heaven on earth. Right? And this is a thing that, you know, like many people may not even know this feeling of living the life of heaven on earth, being used by God. And this is something that people have to understand is we have to get to that point where you understand this feeling of living the life of heaven on earth, that you are being used by God. Like that, like, can you imagine that? That's the thing that everyone would want to feel in this history, right? Even everyone in Providence would want to say, hey, I want to live the life of heaven on earth. What does it mean? What does it feel like? And the first thing that matters more than anything else is making yourself reach the best and highest level. That's the biggest thing you got to do. You have to make yourself first, right? Like a house. You have to adorn yourself. You have to put effort into it. You have to put more effort into it. You have to, then you get to a point where you even value yourself more. When you see those people who really, really value themselves, like people who are like very, very high up in business or, or they're in their craft or trade actors, whatever, the way they treat themselves is unbelievable. The way they work out, the things that they eat, the things that they do, the things that they won't do, they won't smoke, they won't drink, right? they won't do a lot of different things because they value themselves and they put a lot of work into themselves too. And it makes sense. People, now when, the more and more you hear, you're like, oh, that's what, it, that's what it means. People are living according to their efforts. That's what a rewarding life is. The rewarding life is dependent upon what we do, how we build our house, how we build ourselves, how we make ourselves. Because then we're used by God. And when we're used by God, then we can live the life of heaven on earth. And it's, it's basically the answer to people live according to their efforts. I really like the example too of, uh, of uh, Wolmyongdong, the natural temple. Right? Something can't be done perfectly right away. Like, of course, you talk, uh, there's some things you have to just buy and you have to do it perfectly, put lots of effort into it because it has to last for a thousand years. But then the second part was kind of interesting too because I liked it when he says, but there's some things that can't be done perfectly right away, but they, it takes time for you to learn and build it and build it and build it. And it needs to be improved with time. Right? There are some things that are needed just for now until we get the better thing later. Right? Because a better thing might not even be available at the moment. Like, even if, I, if, we, if we talk about uh, like even like for myself when sports, sports too, um, there's a certain point like you're not, you're not going to be the super professional from the very beginning. And some things you just have for now until you get something that's better as you improve with time. Like in the past when basketball first started, they used peach baskets, right? They hung these peach bas baskets uh, on the walls really high up and people were shooting these, uh, uh, the, the basketballs into these baskets, right? And you get a point. But they never had a basketball hoop before. But the interesting thing is, the next thing they did is they realized, they're like, oh man, it's so tiring that every time we score, someone's gotta go up on a ladder and grab the, the ball out of the, the basket, the peach basket. And they're like, oh, what do we do? So the next thing they did was, they realized the next level for this game of basketball was to cut a small hole at the bottom of the basket, and then you have a broomstick, and every time you score, you take the broomstick and you hit, you hit the ball out of the, out of, out of the, out of, out of the basket. And that made, and then you didn't need a ladder anymore. And then it moves into like a hoop, a ring, right, with a net, right? and it keeps getting better and better. And and the rules of basketball, uh, be, you know, it started off with no dribbling. There was no such thing as dribbling. You just ran around with the ball. So 
things can't be done perfectly right away, but they need to improve with time. Just like a lot of things in warming zone, they had to improve with time from containers, like the place where they're sleeping was in containers in the beginning. Then they have like better containers and then they make the 316 Memorial Hall and then they're making this place and that place. And we see that there are some things that we do that do require some time for us. And I think that's something that we have to recognize also, right? I also like, I, I like that this point too, because this is a very big business point that a lot of people uh, in business understand is you need to spend money to make money. You really do. Like for instance, um, let's say that um, you're making a brand new ba uh, a basketball court inside, you know, a basketball court, right? You can like, spend three times the amount of money. You can use cement for the ground or you can use an actual like, like court, right? And it's gonna cost you three times the amount, right? And it's gonna cost you three times the amount. However, what's gonna happen is when you just use cement or when you just use things that are not as good, you're gonna have to keep fixing it. You gotta keep fixing it over and over and over again. And in the end, it actually costs more money. But when you do it, spend a lot more money, but in the end, it actually saves more money. You don't have to keep doing things over and over again, not as much. And the maintenance is not as much. And also another interesting thing is, like for instance, when it comes to like in Canada, when you have basketball courts, if the floor isn't very good, no one rents it. So if you spend a little bit more money and then you get nice, like uh, the nice floor on the courts, then what happens is more people will rent it. More people rent it, you get more revenue. You get more revenue, then you're gonna pay off, uh, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna be able to start paying off what you just made with this basketball court, right? You build something with cheap material, eventually you're gonna spend more money in the end, right? And, and I do think that if you think about this also, you have to think about uh, money is also time. So if you think about ourselves, you just spend a little bit of time on making yourself, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, then in the end, these big mistakes come, you gotta do things all over again. It's better to spend more time, more effort, making yourself even more, right? Instead of building yourself cheaply, and then you can't even get the big things or the big missions or the big works, the things that, uh, that God would want you to do. And eventually you have to spend more time doing what? Things that you may not even really want to do. And I, and I think this could be one of the issues that, that people have of, uh, oh, I want to do this. And like, people want, like, uh, you know, for me, I meet, I meet a lot of people who do full-time full -time providence work too. And a lot of times like, well, why can't I do this? Why? And the answer is like, for instance, if you want to do more lecturing, you got to become a good lecturer, right? Because like, I know some people are like, well, these people won't let me teach. I'm like, have you ever taught? Like, not really. It's like, well, if I had a newcomer, I wouldn't want you to teach my newcomer if you're brand new. You know what I mean? But if someone puts the effort in and you see it and they're really, really good and they're, they're trying really hard, uh, you are inclined to allow people, you, you would like, oh yeah, I gotta give this person a chance. They're working so hard kind of thing, right? You gotta put, you gotta put the time in. You gotta spend the money to save the money. You gotta spend the time, right, to save time in the future. And oh, one of the perfect examples is this, um, are these podcasts. Like I was, remember I told you guys before, it would take me four to five hours in the beginning to prepare these po podcasts five times a week. It was crazy, guys. Trying to figure out what the program is supposed to be like, how many songs to play, uh, finding people who have music, and it was just like, wow, four to five hours a day just working on this, right? But now it's gone down to less than two hours, right? Less than two hours, and then I record. So if you think about that, it's kind of, if, even for me too, putting in all that time, now I have my scripts, I have my set schedules, I know what I'm doing on each and every, like on Tuesday is going to be Sean segment, Friday is going to be Wan Chun segment, uh, on Tuesdays I'm going to do like the scripture analysis, right, on Thursdays I do question and answer, and on Friday, I, you know, and, and I, I, you know, Mondays I'm going to do like the Sunday messages, and I have this set schedule now, and it saves me so much more time, but I had to put in a lot of time in the beginning. I, you know, and that, that's, that's one thing that we have to kind of recognize ourselves too. Uh, probably the last thing I want to talk about from the, the, the Tuesday pre dawn message was just, I, I realized something when, when uh, in the messages like Christianity, people get discouraged and frustrated because no one puts any effort into interpreting. So then people are waiting for the Lord, but the Lord's not coming the way that they expect. So then they keep waiting without any hope. It becomes hopeless. And then 
people get discouraged and they get frustrated. And I realize, wow, in the same way too, if you think about also, um, like even inside of our churches, right, there has to be, like the, the leaders have to put a lot of effort into interpreting the message, like the Sunday messages, the Tuesdays and the Fridays and the Wednesdays, which, whichever days it is, uh, how to interpret or how to uh, make it work in our everyday lives before it becomes hopeless. Like where people are like, oh, we put all this effort in and we're doing so much work, but, but nothing's really happening. And, and I, you know, we hear that sometimes where people feel so discouraged because they put so much effort in, but there's no fruit, right? There's just no fruit. And this can cause discouragement, it cause hopelessness, it causes frustration, it causes tons of different things. And I realize that, yeah, in the same way too, it's not just Christianity where there's no effort interpreting, but also for us too, we have to keep raising our levels. We have to keep becoming those people uh, as leaders uh, to find out, whoa, well, the message said, well, God said this, so what should we do next? What should be the next thing? That everything is leading towards an ending in everything that we do, with, with, where all of our efforts don't literally come in vain. Right, that there is going to be an effort that works towards a finishing product or some finishing result, and it, the result may not even be what we think. It may not be even that great, but there at least there is a result where people like, "Oh wow, we did this, and this worked out, and this didn't work out, and we're gaining more from it." Right, so I I, I do think uh, it made me think a lot, not so much about the Christianity part, but about wow, as leaders, how much effort do we put into interpreting or trying to figure out how to put the words into action in our churches, in our departments, in our groups, in our teams, right? Because that's one of the frustrating things is when we do the when we have certain things, but we just don't know, uh, like I don't know what do we like we put a lot of effort in, but nothing really came out of it. And then it becomes really, really hopeless. And I, I hope that that's can, that can be something that all of us too, when we, look, when we look at these messages, we'll be able to realize more and more of what is going on and what is happening, all right? So uh, that is the Tuesday pre-dawn uh, message. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the song of choice for today. It is Wednesday. We're gonna have an amazing service tonight. Uh, today, I chose a cover of this song called Make You Feel My Love. And the cover is from a guy, we, I, I played him about two times already. His name is Teddy Swims. And he's an American singer-songwriter from Atlanta, Georgia. And he grew up, uh, he did like, he was a musical theater student. He was a football player. Oh, if you guys see this guy, he's huge, right? Uh, like he looks like a football player. And uh, he was also the grandson of, grandson of a Pentecostal pastor. So a very, very interesting history, but he's got this great song. Uh, he's got a great voice. It's husky, but uh, I know this is a very romantic song, Make You Feel My Love, but this is a kind of a male version of it, but it's really, really good. So this is Tw Teddy Swims, and he's covering the song, Make You Feel My Love. I go 
crawling down the avenue There is nothing that I wouldn't do To make you feel my love And that is Teddy Swims with uh, Make You Feel My Love. What a great song. Uh, man, It's you can just get totally engrossed into that song. So good. Uh, if you guys want uh, to hear that again, I left the link in the description for you guys there too. Uh, which means it's going to lead us into the last portion of today's um, podcast. And we're going to go a little bit more deeper into the story of Solomon. Okay. And yesterday we did talk about uh, his alliance with Egypt, how he got his wisdom with the thousand bird offerings, and also the wise ruling he made with the two prostitutes and the babies that di- the baby that died. Uh, what we want to talk about today is something uh, very important, which is going to be of the building of the temple, right? And uh, they call this Solomon's temple, and this was the first, the first temple the Israelites built for God. And they also called it the first temple. So Solomon's temple, first temple, built by Solomon. And it stood right next to the king's palace and was both God's royal palace and Israel's center of worship. So this temple was, when you look at it, it's a symbol of holiness and royalty. And it reminded the Israelites that God was the special head of Israel, the king. It was patterned after the tabernacle and in general, other temples at that time and was divided into three important areas, the most holy place, the holy place, and the outer courtyard. It was built in Jerusalem on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, where Solomon's father David had bought to build an altar to God. Now at first, King David wanted to build this temple, but according to the Bible, God said to him through the prophet Nathan, You are not to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. However, God chose Solomon to build the temple. And before King David's death, David gave his son Solomon the plans for the building of the temple, instructions for the priests and Levites, and all the work of serving in the temple. He also gave his own money to Solomon to help him build the temple and asked the people to help give gifts of money. Now, King Solomon sent a message to Hiram, king of Tyre, who had been friends with his father David, and sent uh, and asked him to send lots of wood to build his palace. And in this message, Solomon said that he wanted to build a temple for the Lord and asked Hiram to send him wood for the temple. So Hiram said that he would if Solomon gave food for the cost of the wood and work and, and for the work that people did. So Hiram gave Solomon all the cedar and pine logs he wanted, and Solomon gave Hiram wheat for his family 
and 20,000 baths, or about 434,000 liters of olive oil. King Hiram cut down the wood and sent them on rafts to a place called Joppa, and from there they could take the wood up to Jerusalem. According to the Bible, in the 480th year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the second month he began to build the temple of the Lord. So King Solomon brought Huramabi, whose mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and whose father was a man from Tyre, and a person who was a craftsman in bronze. Now, Huramabi was very good at all kinds of work. And it says in the Bible that he was, a, he was skilled to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, purple, crimson, and blue, ya blue yarn. He was especially good at working with bronze. Now, when all the work King Solomon had done for the temple was finished, he brought in the things his father David had given to God and put them in the treasure of the temple. So in the 11th year, in the month of Bull, the eighth month, the temple was finished in all its details according to its specifications. So if you look at this, guys, uh, he began to build the temple in the fourth year of his reign. And when did it end? In the 11th year. So how many years was that? So the fourth year to the eleventh year, we're talking seven years. So just like this uh, today's message, uh, the more the more effort you put in, the bigger you make it, the longer it's going to take, but the more valuable it becomes. So when the temple was finished, King Solomon brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to the temple, and made all the people of Israel come there, and they sacrificed so many sheep and cattle that they could not. They could not record or count them. It was that many. Then the cloud of God filled the temple, just as God showed himself on the tabernacle in Mount Sinai to Moses. He now showed himself at the temple in a cloud. Then King Solomon praised God. He said a prayer of dedication, giving to God in front of the people of Israel. And he asked God to keep his promise to King David of letting King David's sons rule forever. And in one sense, even though Solomon was the last, or maybe his son was the last uh, to rule, technically speaking, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah and from David's line in Bethlehem. And uh, so that kind of is a fulfilling of the promise there too. According to the Bible, when Solomon had finished building the temple, God appeared to him and said, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. My eyes and my heart will always be there at the temple you have made. However, God also warned Solomon the importance of obeying God's covenant in order to enjoy its blessings, not its curses. And this was needed because God gave Solomon power and wealth which many times made people forget the promise God had made with them. So that is uh, a general story of how the temple of God was made. And I hope that this helps you guys out too uh, as you read more and more. Of course, uh, there are so many details that I left out. I'm serious, guys. There are so many details of like, like how much gold and how much money was spent and how much this and how much the, yeah there's there's so much detail in there but this is kind of a general sense of what uh the 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 temple of god and what it took to build it was all right so i hope that you guys enjoyed today uh it's a, uh, it's a wonderful wednesday and it's going to be even better tonight because we're going to listen to the wednesday message everyone have a wonderful day and we'll see you guys again on thursday Chip. It's the morning star drive on 17.8. You saw up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this.